What is up, IF Warriors? In this video, I'm going to literally destroy, professionally and respectfully, every fitness YouTube or pundit YouTuber that tells you that intermittent fasting does not work. Let's not take up any more time and let's just jump right into this video. Stay tuned. Now, back in 2018, I made it a journey and mission of mine to literally rebut a large amount of videos that were trying to say that intermittent fasting did not work. Literally, if you put out a video saying intermittent fasting did not work, I put out my rebuttal. And I did this for the entirety of 2018. After that time period, however, people started to calm down on trying to rebut intermittent fasting. There weren't many people trying to say that it didn't work or it doesn't work. People were just simply on the fence. And I posted on my Instagram a certain level of criteria that would be required for someone to successfully be able to rebut what I was talking about. And this was in terms of the methodology within the study design. Let me just do a brief history lesson for the pundits and fitness YouTubers before I dive into the scientific lesson. For those of you that love to scream calories in versus calories out, I'm not against what you're saying. I also believe in calories in versus calories out being the main driver for weight loss. But I do not believe that calories in versus calories out has an advantage over intermittent fasting when it comes to the calorie partitioning in terms of focusing on body fat oxidation and eventual body fat burning. The studies suggest that intermittent fasting carries this advantage over just calories in versus calories out. And before you continue to try to dismiss emerging research that comes from intermittent fasting, let me remind you or inform you that calories was not a thing until the early 1800s. Calories was initially discovered by Nicolas Clement, which was a French physicist, and he used it to measure heat engines. It wasn't until the mid 1800s, and this has been disputed by many, but the consensus is that P.A. Favre and J.T. Silberman modernized calories and understood it on a biological level in terms of K-Cal, which is kilocalories, which is the human calorie measurement that we currently use now. Before then, heat was the primary driver of the understanding of weight loss. Many researchers, MDs, and PhDs believe that heat could drive weight loss and even went as far as stating that you can pour hot sand on your body to lose weight. It was only when the emerging research and understanding of calories, calories in versus calories out, became more prominent that it was adopted worldwide. Intermittent fasting isn't new. And in terms of peer review studies, it has been providing emerging research dating back to the 1960s. And there was a spike in interest dating back to the early 2000s. It is from this point forward that there was an exponential growth in intermittent fasting research. So please spare me the rhetoric of this is a fad diet, that is a fad diet. Forget what's a fad diet and what's not a fad diet. All of the elements that we take for granted now were once emerging research. We are simply on the edge of another nuance understanding of biology and metabolic health with intermittent fasting. Now, we're going to move on to studies, and I need to make this as clear as I possibly can, because it's easy. I can say this study proves this thing, they can say that study proves that thing. We're going to look at the hierarchy of study analysis, which is systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which sits at the top. And the reason why meta-analysis and systematic reviews sit at the top is because it's a conglomerate of multiple studies. It is a meta study. It's a study of other studies, putting them together, synthesizing the data, and then getting a final result based on all of those results. So if you wanna make a sufficient rebuttal to this video, you must have a meta analysis on your side as well. Now, the reason that is so easy to try to rebut against intermittent fasting is because intermittent fasting is an umbrella term. And that umbrella term encompasses so many different variables of what they call intermittent fasting. However, most of the stuff that you see out there that were done in studies are not fasting the way you understand it and probably practice it 
today. Many of what they say that is intermittent fasting are simply very low calorie diets where they allow participants to eat anywhere from 500 to about 1,500 calories when they're supposed to be fasting. And they're considering that an intermittent fasting protocol versus calorie restriction. So I'm also going to do you one better. Please ensure that the meta-analysis you provide does not have any intermittent fasting studies in which the participants are not actually practicing intermittent fasting. Now, yes, we're going to talk about a recent meta-analysis that was released in 2019, but I'm also going to have other studies simply for the nuanced argument that can present itself when someone is trying to rebut this video. I'm gonna make sure that I make it incredibly hard for you. Now, first, we're gonna talk about the meta-analysis. Now, this meta-analysis was released in 2019 in the Journal of Clinical Medicine by Yongging Cho and colleagues. It screened over 2,000 thousand intermittent fasting studies but they had very high levels of criteria for making it into the final design the studies had to have a control which elevates the research because now you have intermittent fasting versus something else inside of that study that way we don't just have intermittent fasting on its own and we can compare and contrast the controls were always non-fasting versus fasting. They also wanted to ensure that there wasn't food or calories consumed during the intermittent fasting period. And they wanted to make sure that it looked at BMI, weight loss, lean tissue, glycemic control. And because all of these criteria had to be met, it whittled down all 2,000 to just 12 studies. This just goes to show you how many flawed intermittent fasting designs are out there. Out of 2,000, because of good methodology like control and providing full fasting periods for intermittent fasting participants, it whittled it down to 12 studies. So they did a review of those 12 studies. What did they find? Body mass index reduced greater in the intermittent fasting group versus the non-fasting group. Lean tissue was not different between both groups. Groups. Weight loss reduced in the intermittent fasting group over the non-fasting group. Fat loss reduced in the intermittent fasting group over the non-fasting group. And get this, the intermittent fasting group overall had an average weight higher than those that were in the non-fasting group overall. So of all the studies put together and they ended up losing more weight. So they had a higher baseline and lowered their weight further than the non-fasting group. And in these studies, calories were equated for. So calories were equal, yet the intermittent fasting group still saw more weight loss and even improved glycemic control. For example, the HOMAIR, which is the homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance showed that there was a great reduction in insulin resistance for those in the intermittent fasting group versus the non-fasting group. So this is a very strong meta-analysis that focused on having a good control setup, a good methodology, and legitimate fasting protocols. So if you're going to try to rebut this video, please ensure that you have a meta-analysis study, not a single paper, but a meta-analysis study that's peer-reviewed, which means it is published nationally and went through three peered reviews. So I don't care if you're a doctor with your own website, providing a link to a study that is just published on your website doesn't count, buddy. So pretty compelling research, right? A meta-analysis, the top of the totem pole for study design. But maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, they weren't really fasting, maybe they, they did fast or, or they, they ate less because they were fasting. And even though it was isocaloric, maybe they were eating less and reporting more. Okay, so what type of study design methodology would convince you that they're not pretending that they're eating less? All 12 papers collectively. Uh, maybe a metabolic chamber? Yes, because a metabolic chamber study requires the participants to stay stuck, almost imprisoned, compensated very well for this, but almost imprisoned in a metabolic chamber under 24 hours surveillance by the researchers who are not only surveying them, but also physically giving them each meal and controlling for each calorie and macronutrient. Well, guess what? 
we have a study just like that. In June 2017, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a study that was run by Alyssa, Nas, and colleagues. And what the study was looking for was a control with three different groups, a breakfast skipping group, a dinner skipping group, and a three meal a day normal diet group. What happened in this study? Well, the researchers went in with the hypothesis that nothing would be different, that all three groups would lose the same amount of weight and have the same amount of energy expenditure. However, through the metabolic chamber study, they realized they were wrong. The breakfast skipping group and the dinner skipping group actually increased their energy expenditure on an isocaloric diet, which means they were eating the same amount as the three meal a day group. Keep in mind, this is a metabolic chamber study that looked at a 24 hour fat oxidation and burn, as well as energy expenditure where the participants could not leave and had to eat the food that was given to them under 24 hour surveillance. And they still saw an increased energy expenditure in the fasting group versus the three meal a day group. Now, what is going on? Why is this the case? What is different? The body is much more nuanced than simply calories in versus calories out. It is why somebody can gain weight with performance enhancers, even though it's not calories in versus calories out, because there are hormonal elements at play that can change things up in the body. A study done by Dr. Stephen Anton and colleagues, which is a good friend of mine, and I continue to communicate with him because of the vast amount of work that he has done within the intermittent fasting realm shows this in what they called flipping the metabolic switch. In this study, they actually explain the mechanism of why you can see a difference in someone who does intermittent fasting versus someone who does not. They implemented 16 clinical trials to look at the trigger effect. And they saw that after eight to 12 hours, there is a switch over. It's called the post absorptive range where there is no more glycogen to pull from the body switches over to ketone bodies via the beta hydroxybutyrate from the liver and pulls energy from your body fat specifically. Things like adiponectin and norepinephrine increase and this lends to further burning of the body fat. And this study was published in October of 2017. Finally, in April of 2020, two respected researchers, Dr. Mark Matson, PhD, and Dr. Rafael Del Cabo, PhD reviewed many of the intermittent fasting studies that we have and concluded the benefits of intermittent fasting that comes with going into that post absorptive range that changes the metabolic dynamic by partitioning body fat as the energy expenditure rather than glycogen, muscle tissue, etc. It focuses the energy burn on the body fat specifically. That's the major difference. Although calories in versus calories out matter, that added element provides a benefit for intermittent fasting versus simply looking at calorie restriction. And all of the studies that I mentioned will be linked down below so that you can provide your analysis if you wanted to rebut this video. You can look at the studies, you can look at its limitations, you can look at its methodology, its design, and be able to make a video if it's possible against this video. So I simply want to provide a certain level of criteria because I don't want them to slip anything under the rug to my viewers or to their own viewers who came to this video to see this. They have to provide a meta-analysis study. Why? Because it has to match the level of rigor that my study provides, which is at the top of the pyramid for research. There's nothing better than a systematic review slash meta-analysis. They also have to try to combat my metabolic chamber study. But when they do all of this, they have to ensure that the study is looking at a full fast versus a modified fast that allows people to eat a certain amount during the times where they should be fasting. And I don't really care for any appeal to authority videos. I will not be wasting my time rebutting any appeal to authority videos, which simply means that you have some sort of degree and you're simply telling somebody that you believe that this is not the case because I am saying it with this degree that I have hanging up on the wall. In debating that is called an appeal to authority fallacy in which your viewers simply need to believe you because you have a degree on the wall. That will not fly and I will not waste my time rebutting anyone who does this. You simply need to either break down the studies that I've provided and look at its limitations to make your video or 
bring new studies that have a more powerful methodology or design than the studies that I have provided for you. If you can do this, then I will continue to debate you. But if you cannot, then please stop saying that intermittent fasting doesn't work. And of course, as always, I want to thank my patrons for my Patreon. I'm going to go ahead and put their names right up here.